All righty then, we're going to talk about motors, as I just said. Uh, first, we're going to talk about DC motors. And we're going to find out about the operation of DC motors, uh, different types of DC motors, or view a schematic diagram for different types of DC motors. You know that a motor's device turns electrical current into rotation. DC motor and DC generators use the same magnetic principles of attraction and repulsion. The basic construction of both devices is very similar. The turning force or torque of a motor is caused by the interaction of magnetic fields. You guys know all that stuff, right? Torque is determined by two factors, the magnetic strength of the pole pieces and the magnetic strength of the armature. Kind of motors have an armature? DC motor. Okay, so there we have a basic DC two loop motor. A little big deal. Commutator. What is a commutator? We talked about this in the lab. Commutator is a device that has little segments that connect the winding and the armature to the electrical field. And the electrical field is being sliced into little pieces of time by that commutator because as it energizes one field of the motor, it turns and then connects to a different one. So it's slicing up the incoming power into little tiny pieces, 22 times in rotation, or about that, or somewhere around that. The commutator also provides a pathway and connection to the external electrical circuit. DC motors can be uh, used in schematics similar to the ones used for DC generators. The armature is a rotating part of the DC motor. Three classes of DC motors. Shunt motors, series motors, and compound. Shunt is parallel. It's what the, has two windings, and the windings are hooked up in parallel. That's a shunt motor. The series is where one winding is hooked up in series with the other one. It could be where you just have a single armature, that's a set of windings, right? Like a different winding. The field winding is one winding. So you can hook them up shunt, parallel, or series. And then, of course, there are some motors that are compound. In the lab, I don't think we have any compound motors in the lab. Right. Speed regulation is amount of speed that uh, decreases the mechanical load is increased. Regulation is proportional to the resistance of the armature. What you really want to do or look at when you're looking at this is if you add resistance going to just the armature, not the field winding, but just the armature, that will slow the rotation down. What would happen if you put a resistor in the circuit going just to the field winding? It might actually try and run faster than it normal rotation of speed. Okay? So lower armature resistance means better speed regulation. The direction of the rotation of the DC motor can be reversed by changing the connection of the armature lead or the field lead, but not both. If you switch both, it's going to run the same way. Now, why would we want to reverse the armature instead of the field wind? Because the Windings in the armature are very, very small, right? And so you have very little magnetic field that's going to create residual magnetism. Whereas if you're reversing the stator wind, that winding is a really big winding that's going to create a lot of residual magnetism. And it might reverse and run at a different speed than it should run at because of the residual magnetism. As a matter of fact, at some point this semester, they're going to bring a motor up, and they're going to be telling me with their drawing and with their words that they're reversing the armature, and it's going to run at such a distinctive different speed, and they're going to say, no, you've got the field winding being reversed instead. They're going to, you're going to say, how do you know? And they're going to say, look at the speed they turn the forward and then reverse. And it'll be awesome. James Watt, one of my favorite people, determined that the average horse could do the work at the rate of 550 foot-pounds per second. That would standardize as one horsepower. Why did James Watt do that? You know what James Watt did? Was he an inventor? He was, but you know he didn't invent the steam engine, did he? He improved in the, he invented
vented a tongue on the skin. Did you know that? And then he sent part of the bright trying to sell that approved steam engine as a tractor to farmers. Now, what do farmers relate to? Horses. You've got to talk to a man who's used to talking about horses. You've got to talk to him about horse power. And so that's what James Watt did. But he was a brilliant guy. And he really did figure out how much work the horse was in doing. He watched them plow the field, and he watched them get horses pulling rocks from mine up a cliff. And that really gives you a good idea how much work they can do. Okay? So electrical power can be compared to mechanical power using the formula. 100, uh, one horsepower is 746 watts. The watt is a measurement of true power, remember? Not apparent power. So this is a number you're going to have to remember Oh, just for the say next 10 or 20 years. Okay? This will come up someday outside of school, but during school, it's going to come up a lot. 746, not 750. I don't remember what the math book or the stat textbook I referred to. One of them says 750. We don't round. Okay? We're not round. 746. And actually, Watt has a more, much more precise number than that. But Everybody that reads this stuff rounds a little bit. 746 is a rounding. That's okay. So pretty close down to 750, not so good. Okay, and then the thing that happens, I've got a friend that uh, doesn't read well, doesn't write well, but he's well to do. He's an iron worker. He's had a good living for a lot of years. He owns 23 houses. And he plays around with experiments like, you know, solar water heating from a 1930s idea. And uh, sometimes he calls it his hodgepodge. It's like he's bought a, a, a Prius, a plug-in Prius. And he calls it with all these hodgepodge, like when he's using these hot rods. Hey, I'm looking at different water heaters, and it says this one does this and that one does that. How much is that in... In uh, foot pounds of, no, no, in BTUs. Probably one time say, how much is that in BTUs? So let me get my calculator. I figured that probably right now because what does it say right here? A watt is 3.42 BTUs per hour. Remember, work is per time unit, right? So you got to remember per time unit. Um, a BTU is about 1,055 watts. A calorie per second is about. 4.18 watts and 1.33 watts is a foot pound per second. Now, this is actually a fairly handy thing to know. Now, these are all from other fields, other forms of physics. You guys know that this, the, the class you're taking on Thursday and Friday is AC theory, right? And the class you're taking in the past is DC theory that you took with someone else. The two of them put together are very intensive physics 12. So after those two, after you take about those, I might suggest that you go take the physics 12 test. You've already learned the material and it's much more intense than anybody taking physics 12. Because you get some of your own. Okay? Now, I'm assuming that you remember what you learned. But, you know, it's not always a good assumption. Okay. DC motor types. There are many different ways to design DC motors to enhance particular characteristics. One of the newer ones is the brushless DC motor, and there's a guy that um, has invented a very large brushless DC motor and they're very efficient because you're not using any energy to make one of the magnetic parts, right? You're not creating a magnetic field by electromagnetism. Or at least half of it's not creating. It's permanent, very dense mag, so good. You know that the little tiny ear speakers called ear buds, exist because it's a very strong magnet field Gideon magnet. Well, these brushless motors are now using this new Gideon magnet, and they're making really much more efficient motors. So now the DC cars, cars are running on batteries and DC motors are getting much better. So permanent uh, magnet motors, which is like a brushless DC motor, servo motors and servo disc motors, Fleming's right hand rule. 
Now, in the first message, you may have heard of that woman's left hand rule. Remember, winding flow of current, direction of polarity. Okay. Well, now we have one, and this is for motors, right? Fingers of the right hand can be used to determine the direction of the rotation of the armature when the magnetic field polarity of the pole pieces in the direction of current flow through the armature are known. So if you know the current is going this way and the field is that way, the motion will be this way. I know that's a little confusing, but that's all right. So it's another of Fleming's rules and uh, another brilliant guy. Okay. Now, what is a horsepower? Now, we talked about we need a certain amount of horsepower to crank a piece of equipment. Well, we can figure out what we need to have from this formula, where 1.59 is the constant. It's a constant times torque times RPM divided by 100,000. And you really have to do a little work with this. Okay? Not likely, but it's possible. If you've actually, if the owner of a company walks in and says, here's this machine, I need a motor to drive it. And I don't know what horsepower it's going to take. Unless it's something you can look at, you may have to do some calculations to find out how much horsepower you're going to need. Okay. Find the horsepower um, where we have, what, 8 inch pounds. At 1,250 RPM, so we have our constant times 8 times 1,250 divided by 100,000 is 0.159 horsepower. And if we want to convert that to watts, multiply it times 746, and you get 118.616 watts. Apparent power. Apparent power, you have to know what efficiency the motor is. And to know that, there are a couple ways of, of finding that. Um, but the simplest thing is input over output. And we know that we're making 156, um, that's not right, 118.616 watts divided by 156. Where did we get 156? Oh, our apparent power, 120 volts times 1.3. Apparent power is whatever power is coming in. You can measure the voltage, you can measure the current. And it's volt amp. So it's very simple, whatever power is coming in. In this case, we're saying that we have 156 VA because it's 1.3 amps times 120 volts. So that's our apparent power. And true power over apparent power is what's called power factor. Power factor. And if you look at resistance compared to the impedance of a motor, it's going to be the same angle, known as phase angle. So we're getting into phase angle awfully early. Phase angle, anybody that familiar to anybody? It ought to be. That's okay. So now, uh, using foot-pounds instead of inch-pounds, we use a slightly different formula. We have 2 pi times the torque times the RPM divided by 33,000. So there's two formulas. And remember, I don't like we're trying to remember two formulas. So one of them, one of these is going to be more important to you. So you can kind of pick out which one. But since we're talking about foot pounds, generally, do you want something that's going to crank out to inch pounds of force? That sounds kind of wimpy, doesn't it? Let's talk about foot pounds, because that's the theory of force, right? Okay, so let's remember 2 pi times the torque times RPM divided by 33,000. And I'll try to make sure that any quiz question is only based on this. Okay. I don't think I have an example to put in here for this. Oh, I do. Good. How much torque in foot pounds does a two horsepower motor create at 1800 RPM? Now, I the obvious thing to say is that about two horsepower. <laughs> but we want to find out how many foot pounds this thing is going to crank out. So two times seven hundred forty-six, and that is um, fourteen hundred ninety-two watts. And we're going to multiply two times uh, three point one four, and so on times the torque, which I think is what we're looking for, right? 
how much torque? Times 1800 divided by 33. So we're trying to get this out of the middle, right? And so we can get this all apart and put the torque to one side and divide everything else by that and wind up with uh, 1492 divided by 41,849.28 foot pounds. Well, that's our torque, isn't it? Seven and all that is all this over here, right? Two times five. Yep, two times five. Two times eighteen hundred all divided by thirty three hundred times four. Okay. Not a great example. If a five horsepower motor is turning at seventeen hundred forty six RPM, how much torque is it producing? Uh, this is a little more straightforward, right? And we're going to figure out how to get the torque out of this thing. Oh, that's what we just did a second ago anyway, right? Same thing? Okay. So we're going to move torque off to the right, put all this stuff over here, back here. We could, if we were a little more mathematically inclined, we could move this torque over here like this, and take this, and flip this, and multiply it times that. Isn't it? Hard. We're turning this into reciprocal, multiplying both sides by that reciprocal. That way, everything over here drops out. We have, we would have uh, thirty-three thousand divided by two pi times seventeen forty-six times thirty-seven thirty. Right? Would that work for you? That work for everybody? See it? The whole thing of using a reciprocal just to get rid of everything on the on one side. Okay. And the last thing, I want to thank you for putting up with this presentation. Okay, let me hit pause. We'll start the next slideshow.